Hello everyone and welcome to this CUBE Conversation, which is part of our Startup and Founders series. I'm Dave Vellante, I'll be your host, and we're pleased to welcome two guests. Akrit Prasad is the CEO and co-founder of AppEdge, a firm that's using natural language processing to automate customer service. And Bobby Napletonia is an advisor to the company. He's former Twilio and Salesforce and some others. Guys, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule. Thank you so much, Dave. Appreciate the time. All right, Creed, let's go back Great. to the beginning. Why did you start the company? What's the problem that you saw that you're solving today? Yeah, so I've been in the industry for about 20 years. I spent early years at several different great software companies like Salesforce, AppDynamics. And my responsibility at these companies was around product R&D and working with our customer service teams. So for me, one of the biggest pain points and challenges that I saw for our customer service teams is around customer escalations. How do we help our customer service teams reduce the escalation impact when they're solving a customer problem? And at the heart of that pain and that problem for us was always what we call the knowledge problem. Customers escalate when they can't get answers quickly. And we're starting to see that trend become more and more uh, common. And so what we wanted was to look at solving that problem by providing a technology, building a technology that helps customer service teams get to knowledge information more quickly. Great, we're going to get into that. Bobby, what's your role? How did you get involved? So consider me sort of like a chief helper. I've uh, I've known Akrit for a couple of years and got reintroduced for uh, through their investor over at National Grid. And I have to be honest, I've, I've been at this 35 years since the, the green screen days. And, and what got me involved was the excitement of we're, we're about to enter what I think is one of the biggest changes that we've seen in the industry. And you've mentioned my background. So when you think about those changes of APIs and cloud and platforms and most of the world runs on it, when I saw what we're up to, we're not going to change the landscape. We're going to change the way that people work. And I believe that there's a day that uh, just like at Salesforce, we had no software. There'll be a day where we have no applications and we're looking forward to ushering that day in with you. Oh, interesting. This is a good conversation here. Right, let's let's talk a little bit about the products. Answer GPT, I think is your flagship, right? Uh, what, tell us a little bit more about your, your products at Crete. Yeah, so Answer GPT was built around the idea that if we can connect to different areas of information and knowledge, essentially different areas of knowledge that customer service teams need to access to get to the most complete, correct information the first time when they're working with a customer, if we can connect to those areas and be able to create answers, find, find the knowledge, find the answer, get to responses immediately, we can arm our customer facing teams with instant answers to and accurate answers to questions from customers in real time. And that was really the genesis of why we why we why coined it Answer GPT. It's really about reducing the need to go look in different places and getting to the answer as quickly as possible. Yeah, so I want to learn more about this. I mean, you know, the, at the Cube, we have this 13 years of content, <laughs> conversations like this, and we, you know, it's all in the cloud. We've got GPT, we got vector databases, we have open source tooling, and we put it all together. And you can actually talk to, you know, decades of Cube. So. What do you actually what do you actually sell to a customer, and I, I, how do I license it? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we, you know, our our customers often their support services teams are required to use a variety of different products for capturing knowledge, information, and looking for answers. They'll usually be using a support system that could be Salesforce, Zendesk, ServiceNow. There's different products that are used for that. They'll be using, uh, there'll be an external knowledge repository and a system of knowledge for internal information. They might be accessing bug tracking systems to understand, hey, is the support problem related to an existing bug that our incident or uh, enhancement that our development team is working on. And they're also tracking knowledge and collaboration channels like Slack or Teams. Uh, and then on top of that, we often also are now finding that there's knowledge in uh, community systems, LMS, learning management systems. And so, because of this, we find that the customer service, modern customer service rep today is bouncing between all these different systems of information to find the most relevant context and the right answer to a customer question that they're working on in, 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 as part of their support requirement. And so what we're really focused on is how do we bridge all of that knowledge to create the most intelligent experience that makes every support rep in a company the, the smartest rep in the company. And, and Bobby, when did you, when did you exactly join Accrete in this in this journey? You launched the company in 2018, right? When did you start? 
approximately two years ago. And, and to be honest, we were making good progress, but it wasn't until ChatGBT got to show the new delivery mechanisms. And if you think about it, what we're what, what the excitement for me is uh, we're living in the answer economy. And we all know that because we're done waiting for data scientists to produce a report about those 13 years of show. When you and I want to go somewhere, we pick up our phone and we type in the Uber and I get an answer. This amount of time, this amount of money, and I get there. We believe customers should have that same experience, even if you're asking that question. And this is where the trust comes in. Today, we're starting with the company's own internal information. So we're going to hope that your trustworthy information is going to be exposed in the most expeditious manner to serve your customers better. And as a go-to-market executive, I believe that's the best place in times like these in which we'll be able to grow our businesses by better serving the customers that believe in us, showing the others that they too can join in sort of this journey because change is happening. And they will either get blockbustered or they're going to come along for the journey. So the AI heard around the world, as we sometimes call it, sort of, it, it, did, it, did it change the way you thought about the, the business or did it just, uh, just wake everybody else around you and say, okay, hey, finally the market is coming toward us? Yeah, I, I can speak a bit. I mean, you know, we, it really amplified what we wanted to do from day one, right? Our goal was how do we help the customer, customer service teams get to information, get to the right response as quickly as possible because they're getting flooded with a lot of customer issues and escalations happen when answers aren't found quickly or the wrong information is sent. And so we looked at this from a point of, point of view of how do we help the customer service teams get to information context as quickly as possible in a world where knowledge is only growing. We're probably creating, you know, two in the next couple of years, create more knowledge than the history of knowledge. On top of that, you've got fragmentation of information, siloed knowledge from different systems of information, including information that might be in PDF repositories, right? That support teams access for instructions or processes that they have. And on top of that, you've got this signal of customer impatience. We as consumers of products expect immediate responses when things break or things don't go as planned. And so with that, we're, we're moving to a world where, you know, this, this technology really allows us to deliver the end experience for our customers. In a, in a much more compelling way that ultimately completes that feedback loop for their use case. So where are you getting traction? I know you, from your website, you got a bunch of logos, for customer logos, Cisco, CloudBees, MileIQs, several others. I'm interested in why they buy and why they specifically buy from you. And, and Bobby, of course, you know product market fit, <laughs> Mark Robert's, your lectures all the time on this. Where are you in, in that whole product market fit journey? We could not have set this up better. So you said something that I love to speak about. We don't have product market fit. We have something far better. We have something called founder market fit. Um, having delivered products the world consumes over the last 35 years, there's nothing better than knowing that you've walked a mile in those shoes. You then solve that problem. And you heard the story at the beginning where uh, Akrit created a product and the next day had 3,000 tickets. I guarantee you, if the product leaders were to be honest on this call and answer it, they've all had that same experience. So it's not as if this is a one-off problem. Uh, that's probably the first part. The second part is the, 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 the budgets have been constrained. This is actually a CFO sale, I believe, where you say, look, your business needs to grow and you only have $5. What will you do now? So you have to do that. And I believe that you're going to see technology not be about, you know, let me go to this site, let me hear about Gartner or G2, and let me hear about other people. I want to know where it's being released in the wild. Look, that building that you see in the background, that's all about trust. We're trust disciples from this from this religion. We, we truly care about that experience. And I think you're going to see where we grow. You mentioned it. Our current customers, they're the early adopter leaders. At Salesforce, our first big customer was Cisco. It then dominoed that we owned high tech. We're following in that same path because those are typically early adopters of technology. And we're seeing big uptakes in manufacturing that realize I can't keep throwing money or bodies at the problem. I must embrace technology. This is so right on. I mean, you see it in the in the data. IT budgets, you know, technology budgets are, are compressed. Maybe they're growing two and a half, three percent this year. And yet, post uh, the chat GPT announcement, budgets are going up on AI. You can see it very clearly in the data. So it's it's taken away from everything else. And the bottom line is, see if I was like, how can I not hire more people? Because labor is my biggest cost. And so that is a trend that is, is a tailwind for you guys. You've raised, I want to say about 13 million in, in venture capital, which is not a huge amount by pre-2022 standards. 
So, you know, where are you in, in that regard? Where are you investing now? Uh, how has the tech downturn, you know, affected your business, if at all? Has it helped? Is it still a, t a, a headwind? Maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I'll share a little bit on, on that. You know, we, we actually are finding that the, the tech downturn in some ways is definitely a very positive headwind or a tailwind for us. And that's primarily because every company we're talking to is getting the direction of do more with less. And, you know, they still want to keep growing their business and achieving greater outcomes every year. But the CFOs are not giving budget to linearly scale, let's say, a support organization or, or a customer facing organization. So we're seeing clear signals where every team is every executive in a business is being asked to show how they're empowering their own team to do more with the same staff. Right. And that's been a that's been a great uh, equation that we've been able to demonstrate with our technology of how we're actually helping every a member of their team work faster, smarter, work more efficiently, be the best best rep in their in their organization. Uh, that's been one component of it. The other that we're also seeing is businesses are looking at kind of in some organizations, you know, support is looked at as a cost center. And so, how do we drive more efficiency out of a, 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 a organization that ultimately ties back to the gross margin of the business, right? And how do we show those metrics that show us on a clear path to faster profitability? And so because of where we're focused, we're actually starting to see really, really great signs of being able to deliver on that value for a customer service organizations specifically. And um, it's really it's really been more of a more of a tailwind for us with the advancements of this technology maturing and and where you know companies are wanting to invest and in empowering their people through technology. Yeah, I mean it makes sense. I mean, if you can show that you can reduce labor costs, then everybody get gets panicked to say, oh, what does that mean? We're gonna lose jobs. Well, maybe, but over time it's going to increase jobs. We, we know we need, we have a productivity problem. I, I want to talk more about your product, Answer GPT. And when I think about the traditional customer care, you have that human touch, you know, relationship building. And, you know, how do you strike the balance between the efficiency that we've just been talking about through automation and that human centric, you know, high touch approach? Are customers concerned? that they're losing that personal touch? Do you sort of, are they tiering? Like if you pay us more, you get the human touch or, or and or is your product you know, functional enough that you can actually high mask some of those, you know, traditional bot inconsistencies? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, but the way that we've designed Answer GPT and, and our core product end to end from day one is to be an AI native product that while we're understanding the context of what's happening between different systems of knowledge that our support team is accessing to be able to get to answers more quickly. We're also powering that experience around a personalization layer where we're being able to create customer facing responses that are personalized to the reps that are working on a support case based on what's happened in the support case previously. So taking into account conversation and context of the support case or the issue that a customer is reporting, being able to marry that context with the knowledge that the team has internally in their domain about potential solutions Maybe we've seen this problem before. Maybe this is tied to a recent workaround or a process update. Gathering that context and then really, you know, in some cases, providing the full complete response that a rep can use to send some information back to their customer to close the issue or getting them, you know, 90, 95% of the way there where they can personalize that experience a little bit more and allowing our system to kind of understand that context and, and eventually keep improving the experience for the frontline teams based on how current teams are using the product and what they're learning and, and tweaking the answers. Yeah, thanks for that. So Bobby, I, you know, let's talk about metrics a little bit. We all, executives want their, their, their customer SAT scores to be better, uh, NPS score, however they measure it. How are customers telling you that they want to quantify the impact of products like Answer GPT? Is it, is it customer satisfaction? Is it NPS? Is it the sort of, we're cutting labor costs? What, what differentiates you from some of the AI driven customer service tools that are in the marketplace and how do you quantify that? That's a really good question. And, and I, I love getting this. And again, this is another one where we didn't even prep you for this, but we've got some phenomenal video testimonials of uh, one of our CMOs and she's been that in that role for probably more than two decades. And for the first time she got a hundred percent CSAT score. Now, uh, if you know me and those people watching this do, I'm an OBS person. So when I say that, that's a pretty meaningful statement. And, and we dug into how she was able to achieve that. And then they literally get a response for everyone that uh, exits a call. 
And the experience was such that uh, through the technology, and your point, if, if you really look back at your question, the bots was an evolution of outsourcing that started 25 years ago. Your mess for less, and I shipped it offshore. Now I just shipped it to this thing that I thought was smart, but it really wasn't smart. And that's where we bring this intelligent layer in to make that bot just be another touch point, multi-channel attribution, sort of what uh, you know this industry is now growing up on. And so as we see through that, I actually believe that uh, with the help of folks like you, we're going to educate, hey, you could trust it. It's safe today. Here's the awareness. Here's what you can do. It Here's those use cases. And that's where we're going to talk into the marketing budget. Again, you heard me say the CFO budget. These are not typical customer care places that would send it because those are cost centers. And um, I actually, maybe at the end of this, we'll annotate some of those videos so your audience can actually hear from our customers themselves that the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, send those to us. We'll put them in the show notes. I'm interested too in, in how you integrate. You know, it's, I think about security. It's like another tool and I can see AI becoming, oh, wow, it's going to solve this problem or that problem or that problem. So you've got to, you know, it's one, one thing to understand algorithms and large language models, but you got to integrate into existing systems. And I, I know on your website, you've got, you've got this graphic. I see ServiceNow, I see Jira, Confluence, GitHub, Slack. Microsoft tools, how does your product ensure that it's interoperable with all these sort of this diverse ecosystems and tools and platforms out there in this, in this space? Yeah, so security and trust is our number one value. And we have been very pragmatic and forward thinking about that since day one. But the way that we have designed AppEdge is an experience where we can plug into the systems and provide value you know, within the first week. And part of what we've had to do in, in ensuring that complete picture is a solution that is compliant with all the necessary industry requirements like SOC 2, HIPAA compliant. But also on top of that, the way when, when we connect to these systems of information, we, we connect in a limited sense where we're only connecting to the information that's pertinent for customer service organizations. So when we connect into a system like Slack or Teams, we're not looking at all the information, we're only looking at information that's pertinent to what's related for a Q&A repository in a Slack channel that a support team might be referencing to get to an answer to a customer facing question and really tapping into that collective knowledge of a customer service organization. So they're able to get to the most complete information as quickly as possible in, in a way that where the data and the information is, is in a very controlled environment. So another challenge that we see with, with just AI in general, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, they said, you know, have you noticed that the chat GPT is kind of getting worse as, as more people use it? I said, I don't know, it's, I use it in certain ways, but somebody else said to me, entropy is winning. And so as knowledge bases evolve, you get more randomness. So and businesses are constantly updating their, their offerings, their policies. So how do, how do you adapt in real time to these changes and make sure that customers always are receiving the most accurate and, and up-to-date information? Yeah, so that's part of how we built AppEdge from day one is a technology that's specific to the domain information of a business and a team and a technology that's continuously evolving and understanding the context of answers that are being created, answers that are being that are helpful when answers are not helpful, learning from that interaction. And so in our case, you know, when a technology like Chat GPT for the consumer and the wide web is different because it's kind of a consumer general purpose solution. For us, it's a very domain specific experience. So our AI and our technology actually goes and finds where the context and the answer is to a customer question. We use generative technologies to, to be able to provide the delivery layer of this experience. So we use generative technologies like uh, chat GPT technologies to be able to create the customer facing response. We're not leaning on it to find the information or find the answer. And that's what allows our technology, our AI tech to continue to get better and better based uh, within a customer environment, the more the team our customers use it. Yeah, we wrote a post the other day, uh, and my colleagues and I came up with the you know, power laws, right? We came up with the power law, the 80-20 rule. Essentially, we had all the, you know, the consumer and the big cloud uh, LLMs, you know, at the, the left side. And then we had the, the x-axis was the sort of long tail, and, and we called it domain specificity. So it sounds like that's really where you intend to play a lot many more large language models playing out there that are very specific to a domain, very tuned to that domain versus sort of the generalized of you know, the problem that we're seeing potentially with ChatGPT. Is that a fair sort of mental description? Yeah, and I would even add to that, you know, not only are we specific to the domain, we're also specific to the domain of customer service. 
and the types of questions and challenges customer service teams are seeing. So we're even more tailored and specific in that domain that allows us to create the most acceptable answers, accurate answers in the first first time when a customer service team is using our solution to find, find an answer to a customer question. So Bobby, you're kind of the conciliary here. Um, you got rapid advancements in, in AI and natural language processing, landscapes changing all the time. I had an investor the other day say, yeah, we get these term sheets, they sign the term sheets, by the time we turn around, somebody else is disrupting the, the, the business model. So how do you plan to stay ahead of the curve? What advice do you give to your CEO here to, to maintain relevance and, and leadership in, in this domain? Great question, and you know, um, uh, you've heard me say this, and I'll state it consistently: is that the customer is always always right because they have the pocketbook. It doesn't mean they're always right technically. And so, if you look at the way in which we're engaging our early early customers, and you ask a question, I want to come back to in terms of the amount of money. When you have founder market fit, you don't need as much money to go fishing in the ocean to see if somebody likes your product and what benefits they might have. You take and you show that I can acquire a customer in 35 days, get you up and running in less than 24 hours. By the way, we haven't even talked about the system integrators. At Salesforce, we change that landscape and everyone from Accenture to people you didn't know had to readopt business models. We will do the same thing here because I don't need you to screw and glue. Dave, I know your age. So if you remember the days that the TIBCOs and the integration layers became the most important part, and then when they got the understanding of what the data was and what it was doing, that's essentially what we're doing with knowledge, which is far more powerful than data. Data is just the gold dust. Knowledge is the jewelry we can wear and take advantage of and the shiny, shiny, valuable pieces. So you'll see a drumbeat of success, focus on ecosystems, and then I'm very eager to see how the the ecosystem of deployment gets up and running because because I would like maybe a crit to say within 24 hours, you're seeing value. And, and sometimes when we get a prospect on the phone, we've actually scraped their site and I let you ask me a question. And so the 30 day trial doesn't even work anymore because I can have a trial up and running in 30 seconds, 30 minutes, probably. Um, anything you want to share on that? Because seeing is believing, showcasing those testimonials and the proof is in the pudding. What more do you need? Do the customers will be foolish not to move forward? Yeah, you know, one thing I'll add to that, uh, Bobby sharing was very top of mind for us from day one was how do we get to fast time to value, right? Building a solution technology that's low lift, low touch, easy time to value. And that is the ethos of how we built the technology from day one. So for us to connect into, you know, even like four or five different systems of knowledge or information, we can do that in a few minutes and be up and running within a day. We're going to a, a motion there where you know this this gets to be within a few minutes, not just a few hours, uh, and getting people to to real time harness the value of their collective domain information in a way that is scalable to create answers, get to knowledge that ultimately today is going to drive faster, higher quality customer service experiences. You know, I, I um I got to ask you guys. It was. Um... I was looking, reading the, the other day that leaked Google memo, even Google says we have no moats and neither does open AI. And, and I was listening to a friend of the cube, Jerry Chen, who's been on many times. And he was talking about, you know, moats in, in this new world. And yeah, there's maybe some, some changes, but his point was, you know what? The, the old moats still matter. It's time to market. It's the, your, your go-to-market prowess, it's your, your, your brand, it's your customer relationships. How do you guys think about moats in this, in this new world? What's different and, and what's the same? Yeah, I, I can speak to it more from the, the product technology lens that we're learning. So, you know, one of the things with AppEdge that allows our system to get better over time is we have automa workflow automation capabilities built into the product where if you're seeing a recurring customer service problem, right, you can actually use our system to create the ability to cluster common support problems, and then be able to take repeatable action workflows on it. And that allows our system to get smarter, where if new issues are coming in, we know that this is the most consistent repeatable answer for this customer, right? But in a way where it can still be personalized to that specific customer and their response and their experience. And so we have underlying areas in our technology where we're building the data mode by understanding the relationships between the data across these systems of knowledge with respect to customer questions and service issues, being able to understand which cases and support problems are related, which knowledge is often linked to that information and related that may be outside a help desk system and being able to allow our system to get smarter and smarter for a domain specific company based on the answers that are being provided from the reps using AppTouch day to day. 
Yeah, Bobby, we're, we're way over the time I said it was going to take, but it's so interesting. But I'll, I'll give you the penultimate word. Oh, moat. So if you, again, know anything about me, I love moat builders. I think one of the biggest, best moats we've seen in this industry happens to be the app exchange that we built at Salesforce. And everyone would have believed that the moat was the delivery mechanism. And I want to be very, 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 very articulate in those words. All GPT is, is a delivery mechanism, just like the cloud is a delivery mechanism. It doesn't fundamentally do anything except how we consume it. So we have to remember that it's like an exit ramp to a, to a highway. It just gets us there faster, easily digestible. I believe our moats are going to hinge on two things, knowledge and answers. Look, our kids do this today. I don't want to go ask a person to get a question, to get a good question, to get, I want the answer. I want it now. That's where we're going into. So our ability to deliver answers to your knowledge today, to project how you can grow your business tomorrow will be the moat that matters. So time to value, time to install. And more importantly, that CSAT score we spoke of earlier, let's see if you can get to a hundred percent. All right, thank you. And, and Akrit, last question for you. So where do I get more information? I know I can go to appedge.io. Anything else you want to share with us? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're constantly investing in more material. You know, a lot of times we find everyone's excited about how they can apply generative technologies to their use case. And we have a very practical use case for applying this to the frontline reps that, that deal with frustrated customers day in and day out. How do we empower their experiences? So we have knowledge that we're creating in our own blog content. We've got information we're publishing on social. We have videos we're creating with all of our customers, video testimonials of value. We're launching a new series. Uh, Bobby can speak a bit more to it, but an education series. So we're continuously looking to allow more of the industry to understand, hey, this technology is here to stay, but it's here to be used in a very practical way You know, for certain use cases that allow your team to be better, allow your people to be better, faster, more efficient. And uh, it's it's a channel that I saw in my early in my early career happen in the world of automation and manufacturing. How manufacturing and automation tools led to more efficiencies for people. That was in a kind of a different environment. Now we're seeing that same pattern happen in the world of customer service. I think generative AI and AI technology is really making every single person in a company, you know, five to ten x more efficient and and capable. That ultimately leads to better customer experiences. So we'll be publishing a lot more content around. The, the excitement we have in the space and the value where we're going. And, and I actually do have one more question. You guys, where are you in, in, in money? Are you raising money? Are you good? Yeah, we, we recently raised a, a decent sized round of funding from a few investors. We got preempted interest. So we took that as an opportunity for us to really double down, triple down, move faster and bring in the value of what we built to the rest of the market. We're not fundraising actively at the moment. We're going to look to come, come for um, focus on that at some point in, in the future as we keep growing, but we've, We've just kind of beat, beaten goals on our on our milestones for quarter, so we're just executing uh, and and logos and customers. Yeah, good. If you don't have to raise money right now, that's a that's a good thing, um, especially for a company who started around when you did. And a lot of companies are, you know, they talk about the the zombie corns. You're not one. So guys, thanks so much for uh, spending some time with the cube, and uh, best of luck to you. Thanks for having us. We look forward to seeing you around in the follow up series. Thank you, you so much. Okay, and thank you for watching. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Conversations. We'll see you next time.